Okay, so welcome everybody. My name is Paul de Fromont. I'm working in the Observatoire de Paris. And today I will show you how it is possible to constrain modified gravity with cosmic voids and the so-called compensated structures. So most of my talk will be dedicated to define what I call compensated structures. So this is a well-known sketch of the structuration of the universe on very large scales. So for example, this is a slice of 162 megaparsec in the DU simulation. So this is only the, mat the dark matter mat uh, field. So you have no galaxies here, just dark matter. So this, uh, in this cosmic web, you have very high massive regions, which I call, for example, haters. These are the region here, for example. It's, there are also filaments, uh, overdense region connecting these haters. But the most, uh, the very large volume of the universe is composed by cosmic voids, which are these regions where the local density is smaller than the average density. So this is the cosmic web today. So what are cosmic voids? Cosmic voids, by definition, are the emptiest region in, in the universe, and they also fill the large, the very large majority of the volume today. Almost 95% depends on the definition, but a very large volume. And they have some typical compensated profiles. So what does that mean? That means that here there is a density profile measured in a galactic survey. So this is a radial profile, so average over angles. And you see that you have an underdense central core surrounded by an overdense compensation belt. Of course, the overdensity around compensate or should compensate the under density, the central under, under density. What is interesting with these objects is that they tend to sphericity. During their evolution, they tend to sphericity, whereas if you consider overdense regions, during their collapse, they will increase their ellipticity. Also, these regions are known to be particularly sensitive to dark energy and modified gravity, because basically you don't have the very huge baryonic effects that you have, for example, in galaxy clusters, etc. So these regions are expected to be good pro for dark energy and modified gravity. The problem is that if you want to constrain efficiently cosmology, we need something to compare to. This is the base of physics. If you want to, to understand something, we need a model and we compare it to what we observe in the sky. So there have been many approaches to model uh, cosmic void. For example, simple approaches like you model topat profiles. This is very rough. There have been parametric approaches where you run numerical simulation and you find parametric profiles. There are also other approaches like low normal, etc. But there is not really a physical, a physically motivated model, nonlinear, that uh, makes prediction on the size and the shape and the evolution of these regions. So um, this is the goal of my talk to show, to introduce something that e that's aimed to describe these regions. So here, for example, let me go back on a crucial point. This is a spherical profile around uh, minima. So around this is a cosmic void in numerical simulation. So this is the, radi the radius in moving megaparsec. So in dash line, you have the density contrast, the av spherically average density contrast. And the full line is the mass contrast. So it is nothing more than the, the integrated density contrast or the fraction of the mass divided by the homogeneous mass. Again, this is still assuming that I, I can measure the whole dark matter field. There is no bias here. So what you can see is that there exists a particular radius, which I'll call the compensation radius, where the mass exactly compensates. That means that this central under density is exactly compensated by this over density. So just to fix the ideas, the area, the area are not the same, but the mass is just the integral of R square times density. So there is a finite compensation radius where the enclosed mass is exactly the homogeneous mass. What is there interesting is that you can find exactly the same thing for the symmetric of cosmic voids, which are, for example, halos or galaxy or galactic, galactic, galactic clusters. Here, I show the uh, density contrast and the mass contrast around uh, dark matter halo at z equals zero. Again, you have an overdense core, which is surrounded by an underdense compensation, uh, compensation belt. And there is also a finite compensation scale, which is here, again, 30 megaparsec, the same as here. But this is just, you can have as many compensation radius as, as you want. So the goal is to model these regions. So that's why I introduce what I call the co-spheres for compensated spherical regions. So this, re this model is built to describe what I showed you before. So by definition, since there is, is we consider just isotropy on large scales, and due to our stacking procedure, I will only focus on spherical symmetry. Also, by definition, my structures, so these co-spheres, will be centered on extrema of the density field. So for example, if you have a minima, this will see the cosmic void. If you have a maxima, this will see something like a halo. And due to the mass conservation, if I have a non-biased uh, tracer field, every profile should be compensated. That means that there exists, for each extrema, there exists a finite compensation radius 
the first one, such that the, dense, the mass contrast vanishes. This is what I call the composition radius. So each extrema is linked to one, and one single composition radius. So this is, for example, the profiles that you get in numerical simulation, still at z equals zero, and this is the mass contrast profile. So you can see that for uh, you have different composition radii, for example, from almost 15 to 80, but you can find much higher composition radii. And this is centered on local minima, so you are describing cosmic void. This is centered on local extra mass, so this is centered on dark matter haters. So the goal here is to model these, these structures, these spherical structures, and to, to study the imprints, the impact of dark energy and modified gravity on these particular regions. So let's have a look to the dynamical evolution of these structures. So using the numerical simulation, we're able to follow the, the, the redshift evolution of these profiles. So here I show uh, the same average profile and its evolution during the cosmic history. So this is a different redshift. The scale here is in commoving megaparsec. So this is still the mass contrast profile. You can see two things. First, the, the composition radius seems appears to be conserved in commoving coordinates. And also the profile today, which is this one, appears like the nonlinear evolution of something of an initial profile that has exactly the same shape, the same properties. You have this for, for voids, you have exactly the same for, for cosmic haters, for dark matter haters. So from numerical simulation, you can see two things. First, that these cospheres are, are originally generated in the, in the primordial universe, which is expected to be Gaussian, but that also they are conserving their commoving compensation radius. In fact, this is something which is logical. It's just due to the fact that the compensation radius isolates spheres whose average density is, by definition, the uh, homogeneous density. So this, this radius evolves exactly as the uh, scale factor of the universe. So cospheres can be seen as spatially bounded replicas of the universe, almost isolated. OK, so if you want to describe these regions in Gaussian, in, in the primordial universe, you must, uh, you must study the constraints Gaussian random field. So you must implement two sets of constraints. First, the fact that you are centered on local extrema. So this was done almost uh, 40 years ago by BBKS. But you also must implement a new constraint, which is to say that the field compensates on a finite scale. So this is a new set of constraints. Using this, you can derive both average density profiles, and so mass contrast profiles, and also the statistical, the statistical distribution of the parameters of the profile. So this provides you theoretical predictions that you could measure, however, it is only in Gaussian random field. So this is a very high redshift. So now the question is, so yeah, this is, for example, the kind of profile that you obtain in Gaussian random field. So this is theoretical profile, mass contrast profile, normalized by the, uh, the error mass fluctuation, and this is for various composition radii. So this is for a central extrema, maxima. This is for a central minima. You got the exact symmetric case. OK, <coughs> so in this Gaussian random field, you can compute the profile. You can also derive the, the statistics of these regions. So when I say statistics, what does it mean? For example, you can compute the PDF of the compensation density, which is just the, the, the density contrast on the sphere of radius R1. So this is what you get, for example, in the simulation. This is a high redshift. The uh, histogram comes from the simulation, and the curve here are derived using this formalism. And you can see that you are indeed able to reproduce what you measure in simulation. This is in lambda CDM cosmology. But at least if you can reconstruct in lambda CDM, then you can expect to reconstruct in other cosmologies. OK, now the question is, how can you pass from very high redshift from Gaussian random field to the, uh, to the actually non-linearly structured universe? Uh, so what is the appropriate dynamics? Since we're considering spherical regions, by definition, the simplistic dynamics that we should use is the spherical collapse, of course, because it provides a nonlinear dynamics that goes uh, beyond the linear approximation or even the Zeldovich, and also this is the easiest symmetry that we know in physics. So if you combine the Gaussian random field prediction together with the spherical collapse, you can show that at the end you are indeed able to reproduce with a very high accuracy the profile today. So here in blue you have the numerical profile that you see in the simulation. So uh, this is for 20 megaparsec, a composition radius of 20 megaparsec. This is still the, the mass contrast profile. So and in red you have the expectation from the cosphere formalism with the uh, spherical collapse evolution. 
This is for Halo, and this is this time for central minima, so this is for Cosmic Void. And here again, you are able to reproduce the profile on almost all scales. So that tells you that now you have a model that provides you some prediction for the shape and also the statistics of these regions. Now, can we really probe dark energy and what can we learn from these regions? So let me consider the case of, uh, of Ornesky model, at least in the quasi-static approximation. So we know that uh, modified gravity at the level of background is equivalent to a dark fluid with an effective time-varying equation of state parameter, an effective W. The only difference may be that there is possible phantom crossing. Uh, the effects on large-scale structures, however, uh, can be implemented in these two functions, mu and gamma, which are now time and scale dependent, so which appear in the standard Poisson and sleep equation. They are just one in standard GR. Okay, so in the quasi-static approximation, you can show that for these kind of models, the mu function takes this simple form where the, the scale dependence is set by this k square parameter, and you have three, three free functions of the background that depends on your model that you use. So if you combine the Poisson equation together with the geodesic equation, which tells you how is evolving a shell during its collapse, assuming that there is no shell crossing, um, well, you can fully transform the uh, Poisson equations, which leads you to this well-known equation, which is just, which involves this mu tilde, which is the Fourier transform of this function, which introduces three functions of time, g0, g infinity, and lambda. Lambda is the Compton wavelength of your model. g infinity is the effective gravitational coupling that you feel for scale outside the Compton wavelength. And g0 is the effective gravitational coupling that you feel inside the Compton wavelength. So on this level, all your modified gravity models in the quasi-static approximation are just parameterized by three functions of time, at least in this spherical evolution. Uh, at the end, you, you combine with the, um, with the equation of the, with the dynamical equation for the shell, and you get the dynamical equation for each shell, so this is the spherical evolution of each shell. The difference is that is this gf over g, which is normally one in standard gr, and now in modified gravity models, it is both time and scale dependence. So this factor here encodes the whole complexity of the spherical collapse. Uh, it's something well known that in standard GR, when you, when you have a shell collapsing, it is only sensitive to the internal mass inside the shell. Whereas in modified gravity, you're also sensitive to the shape of the profile on all scales. So you're mixing scales. And the problem becomes much more complicated. However, there is something which is uh, useful, is that for, for the cospheres, so for both cosmic voids and large-scale profile around maxima, you can show that this effective constant can reduce to a standard modified Yukawa function, which just involve r over lambda, the quantum wavelength, and which involve g0 and g infinity. Just to say that now you can uh, solve, almost analytically, the spherical collapse problem in spherical coordinates for any modified gravity theory that you want in the catastatic approximation. So let's take a simple example, uh, time model, for example. So I take f of r gravity with this well-used uh, parameterization, which is uh, parameterized by two uh, scalars, f of zero, expected to be much less than one, and n. So in this model, g0 is almost is four-thirds of g, whereas on very large scale, we cover standard gr. And at first order, in f of zero, you can compute analytically the expression for the Compton wavelength, which is something that grows uh, in commoving coordinates, which is maximum and then decreases. You can also get the evolution for W, the effective equation of state parameter, which just oscillates around minus one with very small deviations. So using this model, you can compute the evolution of the profile. So here I show a sketch of the spherical evolution of two initial exactly same profiles. So I assume that I have a mass contrast profile with the corresponding density contrast profile. This is at redshift four, so they are the same. And I have two different cosmology, lambda CDM and f of r gravity with these parameters. The green shaded region here is the region included in the quantum wavelengths. So that means that here you feel g, you feel just g, the standard gr, and here you feel an enhanced gravity. So if you start with the same profile, so this has realistic profiles, and you evolve with time, you can see that of course there are differences which are not tiny. And so this is the compensation radius. So this is for a structure which is exactly compensated on 20 megaparsecs. So here again, it conserves its commoving radius during evolution. And you can see that around the compensation radius, you have measurable differences in, you could measure these differences in the density profile. 
you can play exactly the same game for the initial void profile. So you have the same profile at very high redshift. You wave over the profiles. And what you see today is also measurable differences, and notably around the compensation radius. So this shows you that uh, if you want to probe modified gravity with cosphere, so with cosmic void and large scale, uh, large scale profile around the haters, what can you do? Well, I think that you could use this formalism, the formalism of cosphere, and using this particular compensation radius, because it provides predictions for your model. For example, you can exactly compute, analytically compute the evolution of the PDF of the compensation density for any compensation radius. So this is, for example, uh, a comparison between lambda CDM and what we could expect in FO4 gravity with these parameters. You can also compute the evolution of the average compensation density as a function of the compensation radius. Also, it provides you uh, a theoretical expectation. Here, I plot some Poisson on the arrow bars together with the lambda CDM prediction, which is here. So this is for cosmic voids. This is for over densities central over density, so for example, large scale profile around halos or galaxy clusters. And you can see that you could be effectively uh, able to distinguish between uh, lambda CDM and uh, a modified gravity model. Well, I just mentioned that uh, this is something well known, but in modified gravity, the linear growth rate is now scale dependent. And uh, it depends on the scale to consider. Here, in this cost per model, you can show exactly that at the compensation radius, using the redshift space distortion, you can measure exactly the linear growth rate, which is now scale dependent. So assume that everything is simple and you can measure everything you want, which is not the case, I know. But assume that you can, then you could be able to distinguish, at, to, to measure the linear growth rate at different radii and to exclude them with respect to uh, lambda CDM. So what I, what, what I just wanted to say is uh, it is possible to have predictions for cosmic voids, for the profile, for the statistics, together with also the same thing for the galactic clusters or galaxies, etc., on very large scales, using this formalism. So that means that you, 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 you use the compensation radius as a fundamental quantity that links the structured universe and the primordial universe. And using so, uh, you can indeed uh, con obtain new constraints or new probes of modified gravity or dark energy in galactic survey on in uh, uh, upcoming survey. And I thank you for your attention. Questions? So there is a clear effect uh, between modified gravity and lambda CDM, but I guess there is not a, a clear effect between modified gravity and if, uh, and if you transform that in that toy model to the Einstein frame, so between modified gravity and clustering dark energy, right? Sorry? Is there any uh, distinguishable effect between modified gravity and clustering dark energy? Um, I don't think so. I think it behaves the same. Maybe. Not sure about it. So what do you call modified gravity is uh, the FOFR once a week, and the the parameters you are using is 10 to minus 3. Yeah, three. yeah, which is a huge parameter. Yeah, that's yeah. the question. So if you reduce that to more reasonable parameter, like 10 to minus 6 or so, do you still get that strong signal you show? No, no, of course the signal is less strong than this, but here I just show some error bars which are passing on error bars just to show something. But I mean, if you're able to measure this very precisely, then you could, yes, use this thing to probe efficiently uh, only for gravity. Of course, yes, 10 to minus 3 is really good, I would we know it, yeah. But this is just to illustrate. I don't want to prove that I can measure it, I just want to define something which can be used as new probes. And I think that if you want, well, I, I would say if you want to maximize information that you can extract from voids and all these things, I think that you should stack them with respect to the compensation radius because you maximize the information. Therefore, that's what I want to say. So, I mean, and it's a realistic situation where you have, um, you know, you're really just doing a galaxy survey and you look, how do you know what the compensation radius is? Well, you just measure it. You but take I, each but I mean, point. you see galaxies, right? So how do you know that the actual mass is? Uh, well, you can, if you can infer the mass, which is a question, it's not sure that you can, but if you can measure the mass, 
then you can find a composition radius. But however, if yeah, you but cannot... I mean, all I know is galaxies, so how do I... Get yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, from the very simple way, you, you just assume that galaxies are the same mass, and you have point-like field, and you compute the mass, the integral mass of this thing. But also, um, you can show that this compensation radius is very near where you have uh, a hedge, I mean, uh, the overdense ring around one position. This is where you have the compensation radius. So even if you cannot compute the mass, if you just can have an estimation of the density, of the spherical density, then you can, you can infer the compensation radius, which will be exactly at the same position. What? A related question. So if you want to estimate the mass, presumably you want to use weak lensing. And weak lensing right now is only done for GR. So if you want to use voids uh, to, to constrain modified gravity, then you need to know the mass. And currently, we, we don't know how to do that uh, for modified gravity. Uh, if I understand correctly, with this method, you can basically uh, overcome the problem that voids are not spherical, they're not necessarily Gaussian, and this sort of stuff. And so in this case, you overcome this problem. But how do you overcome the fact that in order to know the mass, currently, we, we can only use GR? I don't really know. As I said, I think that uh, from now, it's really complicated to indeed compute the mass, because we have systematic effects. Also, I'm not talking about this, but you have the bias. You don't know if the bias is linear. If the bias is not linear, then you, you, you don't see anything. So this, I have no answer, except what I just said, is that you can have an idea of the compensation radius, which is the scale where the density is just the higher density. So without computing the mass, if you can compute the density, you can have an idea of where is the compensation radius. Presumably, you are still improving over the previous method because at least you are overcoming the problem of non sphericity and the non, non Gaussianity, right? Yeah. yeah. Is that all? Okay, thanks a lot then. <laughs>